on location in the Holy Land. David Taverner from UCB travels with Bible teacher and church pastor Mike Beaumont to trace the life of Jesus then and now. We're back in Jericho, Mike. We were here when we were reflecting on the temptation for Jesus because that happened at the Mount of Temptation, as it's now known, uh, just close to Jericho, but we're sort of in the town, in the city, as it were. Uh, how does today's city perhaps compare to the Jericho of old? Oh, well, two things. First of all, of course, it's much, much bigger uh, and very, very congested. We've just experienced trying to fight our way through in our vehicle, haven't we? And second, it's not quite on the same location as the Old Testament Jericho, when that was destroyed by New Testament times, the Jericho of New Testament times, it sort of moved alongside it, as it were. So you're looking at a place that's much, much bigger now than it was then, but in Bible times, still quite significant, because this was an oasis here in the wilderness and was one of the staging posts for anyone who was going to head up to Jerusalem. If you'd been going up and down the King's Highway, you would cross the Jordan here and would come through Jericho, and here's where you would stay overnight. Here's where you would replenish your supplies and get your water before making that long, arduous trek that would take several days to get you up to Jerusalem at the top of the hills. So a busy place now and a busy place then, by the sound of it. Set it in its geographical location. Yeah, well, Jericho is sort of east of Jerusalem, almost right by the River Jordan. And the River Jordan, not surprisingly, runs through what we call the Jordan Valley, which goes right from the Sea of Galilee in the north right down to the Dead Sea in the south. And that valley is part of the Great Rift Valley that runs down all the way uh, into parts of Africa. And sort of where we are really is uh, the lowest point on Earth. The Dead Sea itself is the, the lowest point on Earth more than... 1300 feet about 400 meters below sea level and the floor of the Dead Sea is even deeper 1400 feet down uh, and comprising 25 percent salt hence that's why it's dead nothing can live in it and the River Jordan on which so much depends around here uh, drops from where it begins at Caesarea Philippi modern day Banias where one of the springs comes out of the ground and it's one of those three springs that is the source of the Jordan. It's going to drop 2,380 feet from up there to down here and that gives rise to its name the Jordan which means the descender and it's the most meandering winding river ever because it covers twice its actual length just because of all its twists and turns. And it's just here very close to this city of Jericho where we're based today. We found a quiet corner, but Jericho itself now and then would have had uh, bustling activity and trade going on and all the rest of it. I mean, what, what can you see in Jericho today? <laughs> yeah, I know. What you can see is traffic, traffic and traffic. Uh, it's a crazy place. Uh, loads of shops. It's, it's a real place for selling stuff of all different types and of course it would have been exactly the same then people buying their supplies to be able to take the journey up to Jerusalem so a real sort of hustling and bustle location without a doubt. So Jesus came here on what a number of occasions then? Yeah absolutely because he would have passed through here on his way to Jerusalem. Now remember we've said several times in this series Jesus was raised as a Jew he was a good Jew he practiced all that he needed to as a Jew, including going to synagogue each Sabbath and including coming to Jerusalem for the three great festivals of the year, Passover, Pentecost and Tabernacles. So he would have been up and down this road many times and the main way that Jews came to Jerusalem was not due south from Galilee through Samaria, through that area of the hated Samaritans, but generally, most people crossed the Jordan by the Galilee, came down the east side of it, and then crossed back over to this side, right here where we are, opposite Jericho. So Jesus would have passed through here many times, and there are several stories of what he did here. But the story we're going to look at today is 
on that occasion when he passed through this place for the very last time, on his way up to Jerusalem for Holy Week that would climax in his death and resurrection. And where do we find that account? Well, we find that only in one of the Gospels, in Luke, Luke chapter 19. Now, why only in Luke? Because Luke had a particular concern for both the poor and the needy and the marginalized, those who weren't included. And this story is, well, certainly not about the poor and needy, but it is absolutely about someone who was utterly marginalized by people in his society at that time. So why don't we read it? Yeah. Luke chapter 19, verse 1 says, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he couldn't because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. Well, all the people saw this and began to mutter, he's gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. So Jesus didn't come looking for Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus came looking for Jesus. Yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, it's a bit like, you know, when some famous person passes through town and everyone wants to turn out to see them and the, the streets are lined in England for us, you know, it's probably a monarch that people do that for or some great film star. Uh, you know, and often you'll see the area near their hotel or their theatre line with crowds and several layers deep and people are trying to get a good view and get their cameras so they can get a picture. Well, there weren't many cameras out that day, of course, because they didn't have them. But that's pretty much what it was like. People were trying to get to see Jesus. Some of them would have heard directly about him, maybe experienced ministry from him. Others would have heard stories of him. And they want to see this celebrity passing through town. And, and here is Zacchaeus, who's a little guy, who's standing at the back, can't see a thing because they're all taller in front of him. And you can perhaps imagine him sort of saying, uh, excuse me, do you, do you think I could push through to the front? But of course, he's a hated tax collector. A chief tax collector. A chief tax collector, so even more hated. Why? Because he's a collaborator with Rome, He's collected taxes on behalf of them, but also skimmed the top and made profit for himself, significantly so, because he would have had other tax collectors underneath him. And so when he says that, please, you know, could I sneak through? You can imagine the sort of answers that he would get. You know, not likely, mate, not after you fleeced me out of all that money last week. And there were no doubt the odd elbow into his side and people accidentally treading on his foot. So the guy thinks, I'm desperate to see this Jesus. And he remembers that there's a, a sycamore fig nearby. Now, the thing about sycamore fig trees is they grow quite tall, anything from 20 to 40 feet, but their branches start quite low. Oh. So uh, he'd be able to climb into it, even though he was small. And it's into one of these sycamore fig trees that he climbs. Now, as you've seen, we've just walked by the supposedly very tree that he climbed into. And someone tried to sell us postcards, didn't they, with pictures of Jesus there. Uh, but of course, it's extremely unlikely, if not impossible, that that was the tree, because the longest living tree in this part of the world um, are things like figs and olives, certainly not that. So it's an old tree, and it gives us certainly a very clear idea of the sort of thing that he would have climbed. And it's right by uh, the main road. 
But it, it probably wasn't that one, I'm afraid to say. But it's a tree like that, that Zacchaeus is so desperate to see Jesus that he climbs up. Because of his height or lack of height, might he have had a bit of an inferiority complex? Well, I'm sure everyone, you know, who is under six feet will hate you for asking that question. But do you know what? Uh, it could well have been, but I, I, I think the biggest thing that he would have been struggling with was how people viewed him because of the job that he had. But whether it was his size, and today it can be our size or our shape or our colour or a job or all sorts of things that, that can leave us with a feeling that we are excluded and, let's face it, that sometimes does exclude us as far as some people are concerned. But this guy refuses to let that stop him from seeing Jesus. So he goes ahead and climbs this tree and Jesus could have just passed on by. I mean, you know, there would have been loads of people about. And loads of noise. People shouting, cheering, you know, how on earth are you going to spot this one guy? But he does. You see, I think the Holy Spirit just nudged Jesus at this moment. I don't think he accidentally saw him. I, I, I think the Holy Spirit nudged him because it says when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him. So it's not like he's been looking up and around as he's been coming. So here is Jesus, yet another example of him responding to those little nudges of the Holy Spirit in life, which are so important for us to do, to not leave Jesus in church for Sunday, but to expect that his spirit is with us in our family, in our street, in our place of work, in our place of study, and to listen for those little nudges and to risk it and to step out with them. So he feels the Holy Spirit saying, look up, sees this guy and suddenly says, Zacchaeus, come down. How does he know his name? Well, there's two options, aren't there? Either, either Zacchaeus was really well known and Jesus had passed him several times. Or again, the Holy Spirit had given him a word of knowledge here and revealed that name to him. I suspect the latter because of Zacchaeus's shock. Now think, there's all these people gathering around. Any one of them would have been glad to have had Jesus to come to their home that day. But who does he go and pick out? The jolly person whom everyone else hates and despises. And uh, I, I just love this. It's like a, a self-invitation to dinner. Oh, Zacchaeus, uh, come down. I, I'm having dinner tonight at your place. Bit of a cheek. It seems it, doesn't it? But you know what? It wasn't a bit of a cheek. This was God's moment. And I sense that already Zacchaeus felt something stirring in him. You see, why would a very wealthy tax collector have bothered climbing a tree? He's got everything in life. A, a senior tax collector in those days would have been extremely wealthy. He would have had a fine home. He would have worn lovely clothes. Why on earth does he demean himself by climbing in a tree to see Jesus. And I, I think the subtext in this story has to be because his money hadn't satisfied him. There was something missing. And you know what, David, we still see that today, don't we? People who pursue ever more promotion, ever bigger salaries. And at first it seems so exciting and wonderful as you go out and spend it, but eventually, does it really satisfy those deep areas of life? Well. It clearly hadn't for Zacchaeus. And he's more than glad to rush down that tree and to take Jesus home for a meal and to invite all his friends as well, presumably most of whom were other tax collectors, certainly sinners as far as the religious folk were concerned, and to just spend time listening to Jesus. See, we've just had a meal, haven't we, with some Arabic friends here. Mm. And what have we done? We've sat round a table together with several dishes spread across the table uh, and bread in our hands. And it's a case of dip into the middle and share. And what do you do while you're eating like that? You talk. talk. Mm. You don't get your mobile phones out. And you certainly wouldn't have done in those days. And you don't turn on your TV. You talk. And that's what would have happened here. Here is Zacchaeus and his fellow tax collectors and others who'd been marginalised by the other folk in the town, having a meal with Jesus, sitting, talking, questioning. 
and something starts to stir in Zacchaeus's heart. I was going to say, he's going to have a thousand questions. But is that okay? Absolutely. You know, Jesus is big enough to deal with all our questions. And I personally never turn anyone away who says, look, I'm thinking about Jesus, but I've got a whole host of questions. I think, sure, come on. Let's look at the Bible together. Let's talk about it. Eventually, the point comes when you have to stop asking questions because you will go on having questions for the rest of your life. I still have questions today that I've still not got the answer to. So ask questions by all means. Look at the data, investigate it, examine it, think about it, weigh it up. Think most carefully, first of all, Jesus said, about what this will mean to you if you say yes to me. You know, he has these parables about no king going out to battle without counting the cost first and seeing if he's got enough troops to win or not building a house unless you know you've got enough money to to finish it. So Jesus wants us to think, question, then to count the cost. But the point has to come where we have to say yes. And it, it looks very clearly like... Zacchaeus said yes to Jesus' offer of salvation. Now, we're not told all the conversation. We're not told what went on. So how do we know this guy was saved that day? Because of what happened in his life. I was going to say, certainly some of the people weren't very happy that Jesus had taken off to Zacchaeus' house, but Zacchaeus did do something as a result of all those questions he had. Yeah, absolutely. He's clearly made some sort of commitment to Jesus. How do we know? Because we read Zacchaeus stood up after all these people were moaning and groaning and muttering, what's Jesus doing going to a place like that? Zacchaeus says, look, Lord, here and now, I give half my possessions to the poor. I tell you what, as a chief tax collector, he would have had a lot of possessions. And if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay him back four times the amount. You know, that's, that's the most extreme repayment required by the law for the most serious of offences. So, you know, he's gone the mile and the extra mile. And he would have been good at numbers. Oh, he was good at numbers. You can guarantee you could ask him any time how much does he have in his bank account and he would have known the answer. His whole life was about money, mainly taking it from other people and acquiring it from himself. And suddenly, the very thing that had been the most important thing in his life, he suddenly finds Jesus has touched and he's hardly known it. And suddenly that most important thing in his life doesn't mean that much to him anymore. And suddenly he's giving it away to the poor. He's, he's returning it to those that he's defrauded. And here's a good sign that salvation has come. It's when what was most important to us is no longer that important again. And it ended, didn't it, the story by saying, Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man is a son of Abraham. Oh, so Jesus has clear declaration now that this man has been saved. He's come into the family of faith. God has accepted him. How do we know? Because he prayed the prayer of repentance? Well, I can't see one there in the story. But clearly something had happened in his heart. He'd made a decision, a change in his heart. And now he demonstrated that. And Jesus said, hey, look at this. Now this is what salvation looks like. So what Jesus offered him was so much more appealing than where he'd been. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And where he had been had been very appealing indeed. I mean, he really did live the best of lives here. Did very nicely indeed. And he need have no worries because as a chief tax collector, uh, Rome would make sure that he had guards to, you know, help him persuade people to pay their taxes, to protect him and his home and his money. So, you know, it really is. He's really the equivalent for us today of a millionaire or a billionaire living in one of those gate at properties that we walk past and try and peer over and can't see. But this day, he saw there was something far more important than all of that. But would he have needed to give up being a tax collector? Well, there's a really good question. Um, and the New Testament doesn't tell us. You know, we've not got a story there. I, I think my answer would be no, 
But what he would have had to do is to stop cheating people. After all, Jesus himself said when they tried to catch him out, render to Caesar what's Caesar's and to God what is God's. In other words, pay your taxes. We might grumble and feel they're unfair at times, but Jesus said pay them. So I don't think he would have had to give it up, but he would have had to change completely how he carried about that work. He would have had to be honest, no charging of extra dues on top. Um, It would have been completely transformed. And here's the great thing. His decision that day didn't just change his life. It changed this town of Jericho where we are now sitting all those years ago because people no longer got cheated. Because obviously being a tax collector, a chief tax collector, he would have said to his under tax collectors, right, from now on, all of you as well, start to take honest taxes. So Christians in significant places can really make a big impact on culture then and now. And that's what salvation does. It doesn't have to rescue you. You know, there probably are some jobs in life that if you become a Christian, you have to give up. You know, if you've been a bank robber all your life, sorry, that one probably is going to have to go. But pretty much all other jobs, you know, what you can do is put Jesus into them now because that is what salvation is about. Salvation is not what we often simplistically reduce it to saying a prayer of commitment that will get us to heaven one day. I do believe that if we trust in Jesus, that we will get to heaven and be with him for eternity because the Bible teaches that. But if that's your only view of salvation, it is incredibly narrow. Salvation is about putting our faith and trust in Jesus and starting to follow him and to live his way and to live differently in a way that impacts this world in which we live, thereby spreading a little more of what his kingdom, his rule, looks like. When Jesus said that the Son of Man came to seek and save what was lost, what did he mean? It meant it was for this sort of thing that he'd actually come from heaven. You know, when Jesus came from heaven in the incarnation, which we looked at in our very first episode, and when God set foot on this earth, he came here not to finger wag, not to do what the scribes and Pharisees were such experts at doing, telling everybody what was wrong with their lives. Jesus came to look for people who knew they couldn't get it right who knew they were, quotes, unquotes, lost, who knew they needed God, who knew they were desperate for God, who knew they just couldn't keep the laws and do what was right. And that's the very reason that Jesus came from heaven, to come for those who were lost, those who knew they couldn't do it. And of course, how would he do that? Well, in what he would go up from Jericho to do, going up to Jerusalem and dying on the cross there to pay the price of our sins so that as we believe in him, our sins too can be forgiven and we can know salvation. And as we believe that he is risen, know his resurrection power in our lives through the Holy Spirit. To what extent is the salvation Jesus offers any different to any other religion? Oh, it is utterly different. Do you know, one of the most common things that is said in the world today, and sadly something that Christians swallow at times, is that all religions lead to God, don't they? They're all expressions of the same God. Well, you know, my answer to that is, well, I'm sorry, but the different religions have such different visions of God that I don't see how they can be. Some religions see as God the ultimate goal of disappearing into nothingness. Others see our goal as coming back in another form. Um, You know, the visions of God are so different that they, all the religions cannot be the same. But really what I go back to is not a sort of philosophical discussion about it, is I think I, as a follower of Jesus, have to go back to what Jesus himself said. And Jesus claimed to be unique, claimed to say there was no one like him and that he alone 
was the way to the Father. Now, the place where that stands out in particular is in John 14, when Jesus is in the upper room with his disciples, uh, the time of that Last Supper, the night before his crucifixion. And as he's talking about death with them, they start to get worried and anxious. And in John 14, he says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. In my father's house, there are many rooms, and if it were not so, I would have told you. And I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me so that you also may be where I am. And you know the way to the place where I am going. But Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going. So how can we know the way? And Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, that is very stark. It's what's sometimes called the particularity of Christianity. It's what marks us out as different. We do claim as Christians that trust in Jesus is the only way to know God and the only way to enjoy future life with him. Now, that doesn't mean we won't have respect for people of all faiths and no faiths. It doesn't mean that we will treat them any the less as human beings. But I'm sorry, we cannot back off and say that Jesus is just one of many. The salvation that he brings, he said, was quite unique. Now, I don't know how I can be an authentic follower of Jesus and say I follow him and believe what he believes if I don't believe what he said here, that I am the way and the truth and the life and no one comes to the Father except through me. It is only through putting faith and trust in Jesus, not as a quick prayer, but as a commitment to a way of life to follow him henceforth, that we can be sure of our salvation. But how do you weigh up then the fact that you believe what you believe and you let everybody else believe what they want to believe? Well, um, I try not to let them believe what they want to believe because I, I try to do my best to try and share the good news of Jesus with them. And I'm happy to engage in debate with people of other faiths uh, about why I think Jesus is the true way and the only way. But... Do you know, one of the best ways we can show it is through our lives. And I think living Christ's message out, living out his message of salvation, showing that when he comes into our life, things get turned upside down or maybe better turned the right way around. I mean, that's what happened for Zacchaeus that day. Life was turned upside down so much as he experienced salvation that he started giving his money away. Now, it might not be that for us. But let people see the difference in life that Jesus makes. Always be ready to share your story of what Jesus has done for you. And don't be embarrassed about that. And, yeah, we will disagree with others at times. It doesn't mean we have to hate them. It doesn't mean we have to fight them. But I don't have to agree with them, you know, and there is this big thing in the West at the moment that, you know, if you don't agree with me, you don't love me. Well, I'm sorry, that is naive and wrong. I, I can love you and disagree with you. And I would disagree with people of other faiths that their way is the way to heaven because I'm the follower of the only person in human history who has claimed to be God himself come to us. All other religions are about people reaching up for God at the end of the day people trying to do their bit to win God's blessing and salvation. Christianity is the only religion that has God coming to us and giving us that salvation for free. And he's saying that, you know, here in Jericho, all those years ago, when Zacchaeus responded to Jesus' salvation, he was a completely changed man. Absolutely. Look at how that story ends. You know, if we could have interviewed the people of the town of that day, they would have said, my goodness, I don't know what's happened to him, but he's changed, hasn't he? Of course, they did know what happened to him. They knew that Jesus had touched him and changed his life. But how great it would be if people could start saying about us today, 
I don't know what's happened to David. I don't know what's happened to Mike, but he seems really different these days. You see, because that's what salvation is about. It is not just about believing Jesus to get to heaven one day, as I've said. It's, it's about believing who Jesus is and following him as Lord and Master and living his way and now letting the consequences of that be seen in ways at times that we ourselves will find challenging and in ways at times that will challenge others but that will demonstrate this salvation that Jesus offers is no mere theology, no mere philosophy, no mere academic idea. This salvation that Jesus offers changes lives profoundly. He did it that day here in Jericho, and he's still doing it today. Well, Mike, pray for us, if you would. Lord Jesus, as we pause here today before you, um, help us to check, first of all, whether we have said yes to your offer of salvation, and if we haven't, help us to decide today to do something about it. And if we have said yes to you, Lord, then help us to check whether we are really letting that be seen like Zacchaeus did. And whether our claim to be saved is matched up by the way that we live our life. Lord, save us. Lord, change us. Lord, lead us and use us, we pray. In your name we ask this. Amen. Amen. Mike Beaumont and David Taverner in the Holy Land, tracing the life of Jesus then and now. Check out the UCB website for the free episode guide with photos, Bible references and background information. Go to ucb.co.uk forward slash Jesus then and now. And you can hear more 30 minute conversations with Mike and David talking about the Bible on the UCB player app. Under podcasts, just select Bible books, Bible biogs or Bible surprises. Bible surprises.